All right, what's up, everybody? If you're tuning into this, this is our first ever attempt at a Shark Week after show. If you've just watched <laughs> Alien Sharks, hope you enjoyed it. If you haven't watched it, this is going to have a heavy dose of spoilers. So I recommend you go check out Alien Sharks because we're going to dive into it. Joining you today is me, Forrest Galante, the wildlife biologist and host. Mitchell, the co-executive producer of the show, slash assistant to everybody else who's here. Uh, JQ, who is the underwater director of photography, and Johnny, who is the top side. No, sorry, other way around. <laughs> Johnny, <laughs> the underwater director of photography. And take two. <laughs> and JQ, who is the top side director of photography. But that's actually all bullshit, because both Johnny and JQ and Mitch shoot everything oh. underwater and top side. And uh, one thing that I think people like about our shows and our crew and why we're doing this is because we all wear all the hats, except for me, who doesn't know how to operate a camera um, <laughs> and uh, do a little bit of everything. So, uh, yeah, I thought, guys, what I thought we'd talk about today is Mitch fiddling with his eyeball, because that's really <laughs> fun for everybody to watch. <laughs> it's, it's weird if you cut away to you. That's why I asked about the videos. My contact. Did it just screen. fall out while you're looking? It fell out. At I'm like, literally, when he was talking, it just fell out. Like, well, how do I Is do there this? A swift breeze in your bedroom? Is that what happened? <laughs> All right. So before we get into this, for background, for background, I think this might be a fun way to do this. So look, people that are watching this probably watch our shows already, right? But us four have been a team since very, very early on in this process. But if you don't know who we are, why don't you guys just take thirty seconds to introduce? who you are and like how long we've been working together and some of the stuff you enjoy about our shows. And then we'll dig into alien charts itself. Uh, okay. I'll go first. Um, I'm Mitchell long. Uh, I've been working with forest since the very beginning, uh, extinct our live season one, season two, face the beast, all the shark week shows, uh, mysterious creatures recently. Um, pretty much everything he's done except for the pilot. Um, we worked on together. So I've been here quite a bit. I uh, started as camera AC, then DP, now show running, co EP type stuff. Um, my favorite parts of what we do, um, besides just being able to work and say I have a job with some of my best friends, is just traveling, seeing the world, culture, and seeing amazing animals and conservation efforts. Top that. <laughs> Well, all right. Uh, I'm JQ Branley. I, too, have been with Forrest since the start. So I've seen the best of the best, and I've seen the worst of the worst. And sure I feel like there's more of the latter, but we've all had a pretty amazing time traveling and working with wildlife and environmental impacts and causes and just, I don't know, just getting to see the world with your best friends. Like, you really, truly can't beat that. So we've been on some pretty incredible adventures together, and it's pretty exciting to think what's to come. But especially these two shark week shows, I think we'll remember for the rest of our lives. Cause they really, it doesn't get much more epic than, than some of these, these last few trips we went on straight. Up. Yeah. I'll third that. Um, my name's Johnny Harrington. Um, I've been working on these shows since Forrest started his career, but before that Forrest and I were working for free doing, you know, social media stuff around the world, spearfishing, diving, chasing animals around i'm kind of his buddy that just follows him into the mud and was like no not didn't really know what i was doing at first but you know slowly started coming up and these guys mitchell brought me on in his as his ac during season two of extinct or alive and here we are making shark week shows around the world and like mitch said getting to do it with our best friends and see some crazy things you know get stung by bugs all over our bodies in places no one would ever <laughs> you know wish to be stung and Sure. following forest doing forest things is always interesting so here dude, we are dude so we're gonna make this one about alien sharks we'll do another one with mike on uh on, on shark versus snake but hands down of everything that happened on shark week the thing that i'm the most scared of is when your mom johnny sees what you what i made you do with the sea snake to help me on shark versus snake because i know she is going to be so mad at me She's going to fucking write me the nastiest uh, Facebook message, and I'm going to have to apologize so much, and I'm not looking forward to it. I haven't told her yet, and I'm afraid to. I'm just, yeah. You know, I, I'm going to see her. Today's her birthday. I see her tomorrow. You know, we're going to be camping around the country, so maybe I'll break the news to her then. But just tell her you know. faked it. You're like, no, oh, that's not real. Ease her into it so it's not yeah, just blindsided. Yeah. 
<laughs> so there's a snake. Yeah. It's, you know, it's like one of the most venomous snakes in the world. Uh, you know, I wasn't wearing gloves. Mitch was supposed to do it, but somehow I ended up doing it. And <laughs> I, I didn't get a wetsuit. I, I got wetsuits. I didn't get one. So I didn't have to do this. You got a phone case. Yeah, that's, that's phone the same. Sticker. Uh, <laughs> all right. So Alien Sharks. Alien Sharks, if you haven't watched it yet, is one of the most fun shows that I think we've ever made. The whole thing was Discovery Channel came to us. Uh, I don't know, about six months, a year ago and said, hey, we want to revamp this franchise of Alien Sharks, but put the put the forest and team spin on it, which is like adventure, action, you know, go go do the stuff. Don't just make it a clip reel of weird sharks, which is what Alien Sharks used to be. And so Mitch and I put our heads together and we came up with a whole series of different Alien Shark shows. But we wanted to start with one that I felt was going to be just otherworldly, super weird, different, unique looking animals, unique looking landscape. And so we picked and, and had a timely and important thing behind it, which really developed when we got there. But um, so we picked to do Alien Shark South Africa. And when we went into South Africa, uh, it's funny because in the edit, it comes out a little bit differently. But, uh, you know, and that's the way TV is made, to be honest. But when we got to South Africa, what really happened was just the three of us, just me, JQ and Mitch went to uh, Ushaka to meet with Ryan Daly, which you see in the middle of the episode. Ryan told us some awesome stuff. He showed us this big sawfish, which didn't make the show. And uh, uh, what JQ, what was the first dive experience we had in South Africa? And how did that go for you? <laughs> well, the first the first dive was in a, in a tank, maybe the size of this room. It was maybe five feet deep. And for us, like, just hop in. You'll, you'll be fine. You'll just don't worry about it. Top right in the water, and what was the shark? The, the bow mouth. mouth. Bow mouth. Hopped right in, and the first, the second that I stuck my foot in the water, it started coming up and literally trying to bite my foot off. I'm sitting there trying to like take it away. It's just filming something, a bug in the room, just not paying attention. <laughs> didn't even, didn't even get this like mediocre, mild shark attack. But at that point, they're like, hey, maybe this this bow mouth isn't quite as dark as, as we expected it to be, but. That was so my first first moment, first six inches getting in the water. <laughs> it was pretty hilarious. This this bow mouth, which is this sort of hybrid between a shark and a stingray, was legit trying to eat JQ for the first like 10 minutes that he got in the tank. And he was in by himself too. But uh yeah, so uh, you guys check that out because we're gonna we're gonna throw that on this YouTube channel so you guys can see some of that because it was really, really fun. But after that, uh Ryan sent us to the beach. Uh, to go and fish for the white spotted wedge fish, which was that, you know, incredibly rare, critically endangered, quickly disappearing guitar shark. And uh, uh, Mitch, what uh, <laughs> what was the one thing you told me not to do on day one that I did? <laughs> well, so the, we decided to go do this part of the episode before we brought the full crew in. Um, and this way, you know, there's a lot of reasons we decided to do it this way, but mainly it was just budgetary. You know, we thought we could do it with a slim down crew skeleton, knock this part out and then bring the whole crew into the, to, you know, a few days later. So JQ and I packed our gear and we brought, you know, mics and everything. And I told Forrest from literally, we got there, I put a mic on him. I'm like, we only have, I'm not an audio guy. We don't have an audio guy. John is not with us. Our, our like homie who's always does our audio. I'm like, John's not here don't kill the mic. I'm like, if you go in the water, that's fine. We got to take the mic off. Do not go in the water with the mic. Cause we only have two of these and we have to mic up two people. And if you kill them, then it's done. It's over. I would say within, I agree. Days, I said, yes, I heard you. I said, no problem. I won't yep. do it. That's fine. I, I, I gotcha. I won't, it won't happen. And then maybe what? 30 seconds later, 30, 30 seconds, 30 seconds, 30 seconds. Somebody's yelling shark, shark. And before I have a chance to pull the mic, I haven't even hit record on my camera yet. He's full speed running down the beach. And I just want him go watch him go sailing into the water. And I'm like, <laughs> and he comes out and he's like, Oh, it got a little wet. I'm like, yeah, no, no. <laughs> and of course, I power it down. We try to clean it out. Like it, it just died. And we were like, I was like, so the one thing and he was like, <laughs> <laughs> which i mean we made it work but it was it turned into a much much more stressful couple days of filming with you know not as many mics as we originally with iphones in breast pockets I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like 90 percent of our budget goes towards audio kits that forest destroys that's true <laughs> <laughs> easily i uh yeah. you know something that's fun to talk about and johnny you can weigh in on this too is like 
you know, same with like Land of the Lost Shark when we did that one and some of the other uh, shows, Jaws of Alaska, where JQ and Johnny, you guys really were the ones who, who pulled up the, uh, the sleeper shark. Um, you never know if you're going to catch the thing, right? And I think it's so funny because when people watch TV, I think their expectation is that you're going to, right? And there's just become this expectation that like, oh, because it's in the show that they are going fishing for a white spotted wedge fish, they're definitely going to catch it. But the yeah. immense stress level that goes into like, you know, are we actually going to catch the target species here? Um, you know, and all the stuff that hits the cutting room floor, all the weird little fish that we caught and stingrays and bites that we missed and didn't land and everything else that you never see. And you're like, oh, that's cool. They fished for five minutes and caught it because you only have a five minute window to put that in the edit. It's uh, it's pretty funny. I think we got pretty lucky there. You know, we so JQ, I was just thinking how we like our plan was to fish in St. Lucia. And then we got there and there was that big storm. And then we had to repo to that, like, I don't even know what that place was, that camp that had all the mm -hmm. uh, antelope walking around. You know, we were like yeah. feeding them and the baboons cruising. And then the baboons, and yeah. had so many people fishing. In the show, you see like, I don't know, six or eight people fishing, but there was probably like 25 people between the two various the whole, beaches. The whole coastline. Yeah. And then it happened. Night, night two. Uh, you know, right as the sun was setting. And, and the reason I single you out, JQ, remember the shot you had me do when we got the bite? Yeah. And we just are like, we're like, all right, Forrest, we're just going to have you walk towards that that rod down there and then just like start running at it, you know, just like finding like little cutaways and little beauty shots to get of like the actual climax of the moment. And the second you start walking towards that, uh, that rod and reel, it literally just yanked at a 90 degree angle. And then you just start booking it and the whole camp we all like move we're grabbing cameras we've got one camera under each arm we still got that one on a tripod mitch is running he's got the audio kit that's still dripping from forest <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. forest is, run is running toward the water with the only mic we have left <laughs> the <laughs> only remaining one we're all screaming and it just like the timing couldn't have been better it was like at the most unbelievable hour sunset and just I don't know. It's just when all those stars align and that just doesn't happen very often. It was very cool to see that happen, especially for such an incredible animal as the, the wet well, fish. I think it, the, what was funny, what's fun about that was those couple of days of shooting and you know, obviously Johnny, we wish you were there, but what was interesting is we, when we got to St. Lucia, we pulled into this like awesome house. Like we each had our own like epic room with AC, a pool, all this like this beautiful place. And within like four hours, we're like, yeah, we're not going to stay here. We're going to go to like a camp in the middle of nowhere on a beach yeah. with no AC yeah. and suffer. And we were just like, okay, and no cool. food like, and no electricity. Yeah. It was just like, yeah, like we got to go. It's like a hundred miles from here. Yeah. So we just literally got in like a safari Jeep, threw our gear in it and went down, the, like down to this thing, like 50 miles away and stayed at this like house. And like, we slept, you know, we each, we had like a, basically a bed on the floor no AC. We got a couple hours of sleep because by the time we got there, we had, you know, we were filming and doing stuff. Got There's a hyenas rummaging through the trash outside. Oh, yeah, fishing. that's right. We have to get up at 4 a.m. to go fishing. So we're like, great. So we and had like, Philip, no and Philip, our fixer, decided that he wanted to start barbecuing at 10 p.m. <laughs> and the bar yeah, which was with a wood barbecue. So the bar, the food was ready right around breakfast time when it was time to head <laughs> out. I think he was still out there when we got up. But it was all, like, I think like so many, so many different people that I've worked with in the past. Like if you brought any other camera crew onto it, something like that, they'd be complaining and bitching. And honestly, oh, yeah. at the end when we when we left there, we all were like, this was way better. Like the house is yeah. nice. But, like we would have much better been in the middle of the woods with nature. I mean, we were hand feeding all these deer, there were monkeys flying around. I mean, it was it was epic, you know. And we ended up to top the whole experience off. We ended up catching the white spotted wedge fish, which was, you know. You know, you know, like like Forrest said a minute ago, like you, you don't really, can't really tell sometimes on TV because you just, you only see the positive side of what happens. It's like, you're never going to see, you very rarely see like, we, we're never going to make an episode of like us going and doing all that and then not catching it. You know, right. it's just something that it won't make the show, unfortunately. Whereas, so like for viewers who watch it, like you assume that it always works out, but like, it's very <laughs> stressful. You know, it doesn't, sometimes it doesn't work out, but that one we you know, we got very fortunate on the last night that, you know, one of the guy, one of, you know, one of the guys, like one of the rods we had laid out hooked up to something. And out of, you know, the, the few fish we caught, I mean, we caught what, yeah. two stingrays, two sharks, and then yeah, the, and the wedges, you know, that's one like, little reef fish thing too. I mean, don't snapper. forget to mention that the three of you within five minutes texted me, I was still in San Diego. 
saying, please bring fans. It is so hot. Like, yeah. you're like, each no, of you I send me like, like different, I different mine, yeah, every versions of Amazon so links to get all these fans. And I travel around the world with like 30 little rechargeable fans that we never ended up using. Because never by then, uh, I never even opened Oh, I definitely use mine. Did you? Oh, mine. nice. Um, um, enough to bring one. I had to that have a whole, a night whole was separate case dedicated to fans. For, fans well, for, yeah. for those of you, for everybody watching that doesn't know, Africa has very bad load shedding, so they only have power for, depending on how bad it's going at the time, you could have power for 12 of 24 hours a day or 18 hours of 24. It just depends on what stage they're in. So we knew that going into it, but I don't think we knew how bad it was going to be, and it was very bad when we were there. So we were getting power for like half the day. So you'd shoot all day in the sun, get back to the back to your room, hoping for just a little bit of AC. And if you can't have AC, then at least a fan to blow on you. Nothing. It, the power goes no, out. We usually we usually <laughs> had it till like ten o'clock at night, so we'd always be like yeah, right about to go to bed, comfortable, again. and you'd just hear zoo, and the whole yes, house no. would just get stagnant, and there was just yep. no no <laughs> moving air, no fans, no. And then all of a sudden, you just like felt the heat just rise and rise, and from like eleven a.m. until or eleven p.m. to like three or four a.m., it was just you're just sitting there in a sauna and beautiful house, but with no circulation, it was just like, this is brutal. And not so to in, mention, in the like, episodes, you know, in the episode, we go to Cape town, then we go out and do the white spot of wedge fish while Christine brubs. And then we come back. The reason it went like that. And, and Johnny, I want to bring you in and explain when you arrived and everything else in a second, but the reason that it ended up sort of going like that. And Mitch, I want to put you on the spot here is what happened with Christine in the first few days that was just like oh, the most yeah. expensive slash stressful mess that we've ever, not ever had, but definitely in the top, top few. And I want to preface this by saying, if you haven't watched the show, Christine is our, our, my co-host in this episode, who's an incredible deep water scientist, super cool, really fun person to spend time with just as nerdy and as enthusiastic and probably more so than we are about these things. So she's the best. She's honestly probably the most fun co-host I've ever had. Um, but what happened, Mitch, early on after all of our planning and prepping before Johnny arrived? You're talking about the bruv situation? I sure am, yep. Or the pass or the passport. <laughs> oh yeah, the passport. I forgot about the passport. Don't, don't, I was like, which doing... what is he? Us. Oh, don't I forgot about the passport. Jake, you, you tell the passport story and then Mitch, you explain the bruv, and then we'll talk about Cape Town. Or all right, yeah, I'll, I'll lead you, I'll lead you up. I'll tee you up for this one, Mitch. But I literally was going through Miami airport yesterday and i passed that same gate and i almost took a photo of that like little corner right there where she had her suitcase completely thrown open all of her clothes all over the floor but we were sitting at the restaurant right across the gate we're doing our traditional gin and tonic before we load the plane and we're all hanging out and then they call you know they say like start getting ready to to board the plane and she starts going so like (laughs) I don't know where my passport is. And then within a matter of five minutes, her entire suitcase and backpack was dismantled and laid out over the entire airport like floor. And sure enough, it, uh, she had left her passport in Rhode Island. Rhode yeah. Island. Yeah. yeah. So Perfect. she so it, it started off with a pretty like, oh God, like we're we might be in trouble here. But fortunately she found it and was on a flight the very next day, but she had left it in Rhode Island. And when we when she came and met up with us, I'll let uh, Mitch Mitch carry on that. Well, we so Forrest and I, when we were when we were writing, kind of a, coming up with the idea and doing all the pre production for Alien Sharks, we, we you know we hit Johnny as well. Like him and I had done some bruv stuff in JQ. We had done bruvs in Alaska, you know. So like we thought we were experts. Bruv, yeah, bruv, bruv, bruv. Bruv. But Johnny, Johnny also made his out of a motorcycle stand. <laughs> then I don't forget. Like, <laughs> It was oh, legit. Yeah. Week, right? That shit was, it was legit. But it was, it was legit, not bro. working for the 5,000, 10,000 foot depths that we were trying to hit. Yeah. No. We, of course, not within, you know, uh, maybe a week of doing pre production, very quickly realized that, like, there's no way that one, we have the technical know how to do these bruvs in, uh, you know, not just 500 feet, which is what we're in Alaska, it's a 600, but in, you know, 2,000 to 3,000 feet. There's just no way. I mean, the amount of line you need. I mean, this the, the whole system that Johnny and I did, where we just winch it up. It, you'd be it, there's no way it's, you couldn't it, you couldn't actually do it. And then figuring out how to do it the way she did, I just you know she she literally has a she's getting her she has a master's and will probably get her 
doctorates at some point on doing this underwater you know, videography. So, you know, we quickly realized we needed help. Um, so we found Christine, who is sort of the, you know, industry lead. She has a company that does this and she's kind of the industry leading person in terms of bruvs. So we decided like, well, let's bring her on to like, you know, help us do these bruvs. And the camera is like the one that Johnny and I made for Draws Alaska, you know, was a couple thousand dollars. The ones that she brought were like 30 to $40,000. I mean, they yeah. were just on another level. I mean, you, if you've seen the episode, you'll see the technology that goes into them. For those who don't know, I mean, she uses a remote release where you don't have to actually use line. She just drops in the water and then pushes a button and it deploys a float and lifts it back up to the surface. I mean, it's unbelievable technology. It's no way, there's absolutely no way that we would have been able to pull that off without her help. So she, we brought her in. She was a co-host. She came with us. And the plan was just to have her go out every day we were there and just get as much footage of alien charges as you can, because these things are, you know, there's not a lot of people, you can probably count on one hand how many videos of certain species of alien sharks there actually are in existence, you know, especially things like goblin sharks and frill sharks and things like that. So, you know, every single opportunity of getting some kind of, you know, image of something underwater, we had to capitalize on. So we brought her out there with us to St. Lucia. We're like, just go, just go do your thing, go out, drop them in the water, and we'll just go out and try to catch the wedge fish. And after like the, she finally, after she got to Africa, after the whole passport thing, you know, within the, she went out the first day, had a technical issue, which sucked for her. And then the second day we get back and she's like completely uh, like really upset. I'm like, is everything okay? And she's like, we, they, we lost one of the bruvs. You know, if I lose a GoPro, I'm upset. GoPro is like 400 bucks. <laughs> you know, she lost a, a $40,000 camera and it was just, devastating devastating so now you know we're down to we're now down to three you know we from now we're down from two bruvs to one bruv for the rest of the shoe which is you know that that's tough i mean it, that's and you know that's that was something that was definitely not a you know not something we obviously we did not you can't really plan for those things it's just you know unfortunately things that things that happen when you're on these shoots you know the I think ultimately what happened was the release didn't deploy properly and or it deployed at the wrong time and came up when they weren't there. Something happened, but yeah, it's just, it was just, yeah. So let's, the, the float on the top, unfortunately didn't deploy or deploy at the wrong time. And then it just, you know, the thing just floated away. <laughs> Which, Which know, is a big expensive thing to lose um, on your first, I think it was day one, wasn't it? Wasn't it the first day in St. Lucia? The second day. Yeah. Second day, yeah, pretty wild. But anyway, after that, after all of that happened, and then we caught the wedge fish, everybody was freaking ecstatic. And then we flew to Cape Town and picked up a whole pile of Nando's, which is my favorite like fast food restaurant in South Africa. And Johnny and his brother Casey and the rest of our crew flew in and met us. And Johnny, you, oh yeah, you haven't been to South Africa before, but you've never been to Cape Town before. What was your first impression when you landed in that part of the world? Oh, it was beautiful. I mean, we've spent some time in Africa, um, but mostly doing safari things and in the bush yeah. uh, to experience the coastline and and know that, you know, in between this show and then traveling to Australia, we were supposed to have a few days off that all obviously all changed with weather. But to Always. have the opportunity to go like surf in South Africa, knowing that, you know, Port and Starboard had wiped out all the white sharks in the area was pretty sweet, but not cool <laughs> uh, to be able to experience like that town was pretty rad and yeah we should probably talk about liam fucking losing all of his shit but that's probably not relevant but that i think that was a was part of the whole show no but, tell us go and get get it boy get it oh like my liam, god so first of all liam will definitely watch this which is fine but liam worships that's johnny good. like liam runs around like asking johnny for like help and advice and it's good because he's young and he's like basically johnny's apprentice so it's a good thing but what is it's Liam it's, do, like a, it's like a big bro little bro like relationship yeah. no that's i mean we're all brothers on this show and on every project we work on but <laughs> we was it i don't remember right now was it at, yeah it was after right we went to a rap party everybody kind of left <laughs> oh this story Liam, should be the episode oh, for the, sure <laughs> oh you're talking oh, about we're gonna talk about that now or at the end Oh, you got the rap party. The rap no, of the rap party's got to be at the end. We got to talk about that at the end. There's, there's yeah, we'll there's, talk about that later. We'll talk about that hey, later. Back, let's I didn't know back you're going to talk about that. Yeah. But yeah. No, on top of, on top of, like, not come up until the end of the episode. No, let's, let's make that be the grand finale because that's the most <laughs> important part. But like, on top All of, right, so, 
Yeah. <laughs> so we get yeah. to Cape Town, and uh, the weather's rotten. I mean, yeah. rotten. I, I, like, it is howling wind, massive amounts of rain, and it's a beautiful place. But you know, look, it's a it's an incredibly violent. It's the Horn of Africa. It's an incredibly violent area when it comes to offshore weather. And uh, so we get there, and it's a bummer, but we basically end up getting to Cape Town, spend our first few days just planning because the weather shut us down, picking up, you know, going to see the penguins and some fun stuff like that, but no actual, like, shooting. And then we finally get out on our first day for our first dive day, and uh, we we head out to this kelp bar. So now all of us here on the Zoom have dove California kelp beds, but I don't think any of us had ever been in a kelp bed quite like these South African kelp beds. I mean, they were just absolutely spectacular. The the main difference I noticed is like our, our California kelp beds are very golden. This kelp had so much color. Like there were reds and blues and greens and not just the kelp itself, but um, just the amount of life and the sand popping through it. I, I don't know, what, what did you guys think? I thought it was unbelievable. I mean, yeah, it was spectacular. I mean, we've both, we've all dove California kelp forests for years now. And there's something more grandiose about diving the kelp forests of South Africa. You never know what you're going to see. And depending on the water clarity, like you go out to Catalina, it's going to be clear all the time. And obviously we had bad weather and our first couple dives in that forest was like, all right, you know, it's pretty surgy and you know, the, the visibility is not great. How do we how do we make these images look as good as possible for a show like Alien Sharks or whatever? But we had one really clear day, and man, it was that was one of the most specta- more spectacular dives I've ever experienced. Just all yep. the little benthic sharks swimming around, and snappers, and you know, just opportunities to really showcase that kelp forest. You know, which we got, got two two different first impressions. Like for the first five days that we dove that kelp forest, it was nothing short of spectacular even then when it was surgy it was the water just like the turbidity all the sediment you like you can maybe see 20 feet and still then it was like all right this is we're in a dr seuss world like this is incredible and then that last day when we hopped in the water again and it was just like i I don't know it was kind of like a loss for words you're staring around like this is what we've been in for the last week and then you're actually seeing like a hundred feet of visibility. You're seeing all the in crazy colors and the fish. You can see the sharks already like on the bottom. It was, you know, we got to experience two different dives in the same location and just, I don't know, both were awesome. But that last day when the visibility was, was perfect, was one of the best diving days of my life. And that's how it all, it's so annoying when that shit happens. I mean, it was so perfect on the last day and it was probably like that for the next week after we flew out. And, you know, yeah. that was why we fucked up our schedule and didn't, didn't work and didn't sleep and never got an off day and all the shit we usually do. Um, but uh, what, you know, the thing that blew my mind the most, uh, and Kyle, you can go ahead and play this, but the thing that blew my mind the most was uh, the benthic sharks, right? And there were so many species, like, I've dove in California kelp all over the world, and you see lots of sharks, right? You see, you know, a swell shark here or there or white tip reef sharks. But in this part of South Africa, this insane um, amount of just unusual, unique endemic sharks. And this part that you're seeing right here was definitely my – it's funny because it was my favorite part of the whole show, actually. So we're down on the bottom. And, uh, JQ, what happened? Because you actually spotted it first. What, what, let, run us through what we're seeing here. Well, it was one of those first days that we were down, you know, in in the kelp forest. And you can see the visibility here is maybe 10 to 15 feet, super murky. And as you could see at the very beginning of this clip, two of these pajama sharks were on top of me and pretty much on top of my camera. And the male had like clasped onto the female and then started swimming straight up directly towards the sun. So I'm watching these two sharks just slowly intertwine as they're going towards the towards the sun. And then by the time the male had like clasped onto the female, they both just sunk in tandem to the bottom. And I'm like, where, you know, I've got a regulator in my mouth. I'm trying to grunt and moan and kick my feet and try and get anyone's attention nearby. But um, I w- was unsuccessful. And all, all the while, they're all looking this direction. I have two mating sharks just slowly, slowly dropping from um, from the top, from the surface, from the sunlight, and just 
you know, got to watch it from, from the beginning. And by the time one of them, one of either Forrest or Johnny had grabbed one of your fins and was yanking on you. And by the time you turned around, you, it was the perfect timing because they literally were right in the heat of the moment and everyone's turned around and we made a big, big meal out of it. But it was such a bit, like it was such a cool thing that I never one thought I'd see in my life, but two, not in the middle of a shoot with, you know, with the boys and all of our big cameras and, and I don't crazy. know. It was yeah. my favorite part of the shoot, like tickling those pajama sharks and like then this whole thing. And uh, I mean, Johnny, do you want to say anything about it? Because I, I got to make fun of JQ after this. But what do you want to say anything about uh, about? I mean, what did you think of the mating pajama sharks? I mean, when when JQ like pulled, yeah, that was my fin that you pulled and you pulled on me. I we had been diving this one area trying to get some cool shots of all the pajama sharks swimming around for us, and we're doing a little talking to camera. And meanwhile, like we're laying in the same position for probably 20 minutes. And these things are like swimming under my arms, tickling my legs. Nothing's biting you. They're just like swimming around intermingling and all that. And uh, to see that and to see that JQ had like got that initial shot of that happening. And I don't know what stimulated that behavior, but I guess it's the right place at the right time. And we just turned around. And after that one happened, another 10 minutes went by and then another few would start mating. And we're like, what is going on here? So it was yeah. So special I, think it was a, I think it was a concurrence of events because like, I've been thinking about it a lot that led to that. So first of all, if you remember, it's in the cut. When we first got there, they were ripping up a crayfish, right? And so yeah. I think that's what brought them in because they are a pack hunter, those those pajama sharks. And so mm -hmm. then there's all these sharks. And then Johnny, like you and me and JQ, but we were both, all three of us were pretty handsy because the sharks were just loving those little nose rubs. It yeah. was like shark spa, right? Well, here's the thing. If you give me enough tummy rubs, I'm probably going to pop some wood too, right? And I'm guessing what happened was there was just so much stimulation going on down there that eventually the, 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 the one of the males was just like, yeah, I'm pretty randy. And, uh, you know, we just, we, we started a shark orgy and it was freaking epic. Um, yeah, a little tummy rub. So my favorite part of the sequence in the show is jq it's your little itm when we get back to the surface and the network just loved it too it's 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 the best dialogue in the whole show could you run it please go you come to shark week expecting to film all these beautiful sharks in their natural environment but you never expect to see them humping in the bottom of the ocean <laughs> <laughs> it's such a good line like well on shark week like trying to be so sciencey or like bullshit over the top and then there's jq like you just don't expect them to see him humping with the boy <laughs> my mom's remember, gonna be so proud i remember when he said that i was doing that interview and he said that i was he was just like is that good i'm like yeah that's that's perfect let it ride it's so so Yikes. good um Yikes. so the other thing that i you know one of the other big elements of the show, and then we'll talk about the seven gills and the orcas and the seals and all that, but is the, uh, the black room, the blackout. So Mitch, that was all you. So why don't you take the point on this one? Cause I had well, a terrible idea how to do it. We, so we, we kind of came into it. We knew we were going to do that, right? No, it was on the, how are we going to do yeah. it originally? I don't remember how we. Yeah. So literally we were, what happened was we always wanted to showcase the shy sharks because they're unique and they do that shy curling thing. Yeah. And then when we were sitting with Ryan at the camp, Ryan oh, Daly, right. he goes, you know, they glow under black light, right? But it's never really been filmed or shown. And I'm like, yeah. holy yeah. shit. I read about that. Like how did, that's like the most alien feature there is. And then I was like texting Johnny furiously. I was like, get blackout shades, get, get my, remember Johnny, I was like, you got to get the UV lights. And you're like, bro, I leave in like nine hours. I'm like, go to the bus. You guys are asking me for fans. We had to bring a backup bruv and all of these UV things. I'm like, yeah, dealing with the line the line. First few days were rough. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, uh, no, so the it showed up at my house at like six hours before I was flying across the world, but all good. But we, but yeah, I mean, so uh, we always wanted to show the, the shy thing, and we we had planned on getting a tank and like doing some stuff like that. But when we found out that they glowed, it immediately turned into, and that's what making these shows for me is so much fun. Because like when you figure these things out, it turns into like, well, how can we, how do we do that? How can we, you know, work this into the show slash get the tools that we need to do this? So that became one: we got to get a tank, we got to get this, we got to get filters, we have to get the you know the special shark vision things like 
there was so much that had to be done in order to get that. So we had to call Forrest's mom and get us to send like the special things you put over your face so you can see. And then we had yep. to get special yellow filters, which we couldn't, Johnny, I think they showed up like an hour after he flew out of his, he left to go to the airport. So we then had to scram one, try to find him in Africa. So we, you know, kind of all came together to try to try to do this. But orig- the original idea before it turned into what it was, was just to throw a tarp over a tank and then have Forrest underneath of the tarp looking at, this little tank and we were all kind of sitting there on the boat one day and I'm like, how are we going to film this? Not, not that it won't work. I mean, it's going to work. Like, how do we film it? Like, there's just no way to, you know, how do I stick a camera either myself or JQ? Like who, who's going to get in there with Forrest and how are we going to get angles and be able to showcase this in a way that is going to make viewers, you know, excited to watch it or like even interested. And then we're kind of sitting in the boat and I'm kind of leaning against the side of this, boat and i'm like wait a minute like why don't we just black out the whole boat right so then it was like if we get way like we get like 10 tarps instead of just one tarps we can just wrap the entire boat up and turn the whole thing into a black room which was never in the never something we planned it just was something we did on the fly and this honestly this is probably my fight my favorite because obviously i'm not in the water and can't experience a lot of things that those guys get to but for me like this was one of the coolest things to see especially Especially the one shark. I mean, he was uh, he just lit right up. You can yeah. see there, you can see the black tarps and uh, the stuff behind us there. Uh, who's that? John Rondano closing it up. And so yeah, Mitch came up with this idea to build this black room. Which uh, Johnny, Johnny, <laughs> you were so pissed at me. Remember, I came out and it was like a, it was the only warm sunny day. Not to mention like the temperature. Well, I'll, I'll let you explain. But well. Apparently Johnny wasn't looking because I was like, "Oh, stay in your wetsuit because you know we want to keep it consistent. We're gonna jump in the water and let the sharks go." <laughs> but Johnny didn't see that I changed from my seven and a half mil into my three mil, which is identical because I like wanted to keep consistent with the look. And I was like, "Oh, it's too hot for a seven mil." <laughs> you didn't tell anyone. You didn't, you didn't tell anyone. anyone. <laughs> no, I was like. I was feeling a little left out because I know after we shot that scene, we were going to have to release the sharks and I had to get the shot of them being dropped back in the water. So I had to stay geared up and I saw Forrest in the Waihana suit. So I was like, all right, he's wearing his suit. Let's get in like Mitch. We had essentially tarped off the entire cabin of the boat. So it's it's like 80 degrees out. It's like 110 degrees inside there. And these are like, tarps you buy in africa that smell like oil everybody's rocking yeah. on a boat i'm like i can't miss this i want to see this so i sit in i'm literally doing nothing i'm like holding a light like just seeing how these things glow and meanwhile like i have no idea that Forrest is sitting in a three mil jq i don't even know if you were in a suit i don't remember oh full fully suited seven full mil. seven mil like while filming yeah. like focusing on the shot and i'm just sitting there roasting and we shoot this scene for like i don't know it wasn't too long we wanted to make sure the the sharks were you know, healthy and okay, but long enough to where I'm like, I don't get seasick. And I'm going to throw up in this tank and kill these sharks. So I need to get out of here. But meanwhile, Forrest is like, oh yeah, you know, just come <laughs> this he's filling in his two and a half mil while we're dying, you know, once again for the show, once again for the shot, but it was yeah, cool. I was very comfortable. I don't know what you guys are complaining about, wow. but uh, yeah, no. And then just to like flip on, cause none of us have ever actually seen this before, right? Like we did a fluoro <laughs> dive on land of the lost sharks, but none of the yep. sharks glowed. You know, we saw some coral glowing we saw a little bit of uh, like sort of sea turtle bioluminescence, but nothing like this. So Kyle, if you back up just a half second, you can see where we turn on the uh, turn on the UV light and uh this is pretty cool. Explain this shot, Mitch or JQ, whichever one of you guys came up with the sliding filter, because I think to most people that watch this, like pause right there for a second, Kyle, they're going to assume that like, this is like something we did in post or something. Explain what actually is happening here. Cause I think it's pretty, pretty awesome. So in this scene, JQ, JQ, James was filming uh, and we wanted to get camera, like in camera transition of what it looks like from the human eye versus what like what shark sees. So on the left side of your screen with the black light, that's what we see without anything over our eyes. We would see a shark like that. The right side of your screen is what the shark's vision is. And what we're doing is we're just basically, if you have the front of the lens, we're just moving, moving a filter left to right with a lens to showcase, you know, what, what it would look like as if you were, you know, putting the glasses on or, you know, to just give you that shark vision. But that's, you know, that's, 
a fantastic shot of what it looks like to a shark. You know, that's what they see. And you're seeing, as a viewer, you're seeing that because we've now put filters over our cameras to manipulate the light spectrum so that you're actually seeing what the sharks see now. Which, you as a viewer, you think this is the... Oh, sorry, Mitch. No, you're good. I was, I was going to say, as the viewer, you think this is like, oh, this high-tech crazy... I mean, these are literally yellow filters that you buy for, like, kids' black lights that we duct-taped over the lenses. Like, you know, yeah. we're... We're making this stuff up. Mitch went and glued one, which worked pretty well. But outside of that, they were all like electrical and duct taped on. But it did result yeah. in just this amazing glowing. I mean, JQ, you must have said 10 times like, holy shit, or this is so insane. Like, it was amazing. I don't think any, any of us expected it. And that's that the other thing. You can see the outside of the tank is like covered, constantly covered with like fog and steam because it was a hundred plus degrees in that sauna of a room so we're constantly like wiping the tank and then we'd have 20 seconds to shoot before it would fully steam up again so we're constantly like fighting those elements but it, it didn't take away from like how truly just rad it was to see this shark glow in the dark well was, what, I, what i thought was my favorite part about that whole thing was we so we shot that whole scene like jake you said it was like a hundred degrees in that that room so we had to just keep every three seconds we had to just scrub like wipe down the wipe down the tank because it was just kept steaming up right so we we got as many good shots as we could but like we watched the footage back at the end of the night and we were like it's good but like it's just you can tell there's steam and it's just we weren't we weren't like 100 percent happy with it so then a few days later forrest was diving and was like hey, i caught one of these sharks and jq and i were sitting on the boat and we're like well we have the tank and a tarp here should we just get some more b-roll of it you know, so we were like, oh, bring it up. So Jake Forrest brought the shark up and JQ and I put it in the tank and we went, we literally on a dock, we literally put it back over. Because we didn't have enough the first time. We didn't, of we course, just, we didn't get yeah. enough, probably did, but we're Happy in there and the same yeah. exact thing happened. We're like, it just started steaming up. We're like, JQ and I were like, ah, oh, this is just not going to work. This sucks. And then I think JQ was sitting there. He's like, why don't we put some sea drops on the glass? And I was just like, son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> it worked so well. And it worked so well. It was like Nine so frustrating. Forrest uses it in his mask. And we stuck in our paper towel and wiped the glass with it. And instantly, perfect. Yeah. And we, we just both sat there like. <laughs> <laughs> but that's just the, some of the fun things that you do like doing these shows is like you, know, you don't plan any of this stuff you just kind of make it yeah. like, sometimes you make it up as you go and you just kind of improvise and everything you know, do you remember it. being up at 2 a.m super gluing that tank to the board you know we yeah. like ran around cape town to find a pet store and then we finally found a pet store on our like one one sort of break day when the weather was bad and the guy's like what do you want the tank for and we're like just just sell us the tank we can't explain <laughs> <Yeah>. this <laughs> like, <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, and then, uh, yeah, super glued it to a board and loaded it on the boat, and it was super fun. Um, I think instead of going to the Brub stuff, I think maybe, and you guys watching this comment, if you'd like to do this, I'll have Christine on, and we'll talk to her about her Brub work and all of the species she found, because I think that's better than us four idiots talking about it. So yeah, let's, sorry, you know, yeah. I'll say this. I'll say it was unbelievably cool. All of the creatures that she did film were otherworldly. I mean, just so unique, not just the sharks, but the like the jelly creatures, the shrimp, the octopus, the squid that attacks a shark. I mean, just some crazy stuff that she got. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, if you're watching this comment, if you want me to have her on and I'll, I'll set one of these up with Christine to talk about that. So if we're skipping over that. Let's skip to this next scene right here, Kyle um, and uh, Johnny and JQ. What were your feelings? This is a, uh, you know where we are. What were your feelings? Johnny, look, you're, let's, let's set it up this way. Johnny, you're a surfer. You love surfing. What is the most notoriously bad place for surfers in the entire world? Like what is the number one worst place that nobody should free dive or surf? Anywhere near a seal, seal colony is a bad idea, <laughs> especially right. in South Africa. Right, especially in South yeah. Africa. This is as that. one of don't even say anything two, else. Literally one of two seal islands where you guys have seen those like air jaws, like the sharks coming out and throwing yeah. the seals in the the air and stuff. And uh, yeah, and we're like, well, we haven't found the damn seven gills yet. Let's see if they're eating these. Uh, hold there for a second, Kyle. Let's see if they're eating these damn seals. So we go to Seal Island. And there's a scene earlier in the show where it's Johnny and I, and I'm like, is this the dumbest idea we've ever had? And he's like, yep. 
and then he just like flops in like a seal. <laughs> we just go well, for let's it. Let's not forget like the footage in the show was like from our clear day, and before that we had we yeah, had first, and first... I it. we we did that. You know, the three of us did that, and somehow all of JQ's footage disappeared. So we had to go do it again. Yep. Yep. And it was like so <laughs> it was Sorry. so gnarly. But I could have uh, died, you know. I could have been dead, you know. I had Mitch, to go the second time, so that was that was my that was me paying it back. Yep. Mitch, what happened while us three were in the water that you told me you had seen earlier and I told you to shut up, you were an idiot. What actually happened? Well no, I it, like usual, I'm like, I saw something. I was like, you yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> So I, we're, we're flopping around in the water with a bunch of seals, looking like a bunch of seals. And I'm like, I told everybody earlier, I thought I saw something. And they're like, no, it's fine. So everybody's swimming around like idiots. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, I thought I, thought I saw something again. And I, once again, I, I told, like, I was talking to the captain. I'm like, I'm pretty sure I just saw something very large. And he was just like, nah, like, there's nothing here that would happen. And he's like, it's not, it's not a shark. Like, it wouldn't be. I'm like, no, it was like big and black. I'm like, it, was, it wasn't a shark. And I'm like, do you guys have pilot whales? And he's like, he's like, no. And I'm like, could it have been an orca? And he was just like, well, no, the only two orcas here are port and starboard. And he's like, I've lived here for how many years? And I've seen them like twice. Like, there's no chance. And I'm like, oh, yeah, of course. No, that, that's stupid. I don't know what I'm seeing. And then within like a few seconds, we just hear like this. And then we look over and they're like next to the boat. And I'm like, of course. You know the, the two these two these two nuisance you know awesome sharks that are the orcas that keep that have basically decimated all the sharks in this area that kind of navigate this massive area just so happened the day that we were diving with these things they just showed up which is like I mean it's such you couldn't couldn't plan it that way you can't I mean it was just a free I mean the amount of luck that you know that happened because of that I mean it just. I don't know. It was it was pretty unbelievable. It That's was one of them. Yeah, very one unbelievable. Of them. Yeah, they're right there. And it's funny because we talked about going into this show. We talked about like you know the mission of the show, the main mission outside of just showcasing weird, unique alien sharks is. Uh, Starboard. finding the seven gills because that's that's like the most important thing is the seven gills are disappearing so for those that don't know what happened was port and starboard are these two infamous orcas that moved into the waters around cape town annihilated the white shark population and have now turned their attention to seven gills and seven gills which used to be relatively common which are totally alien shark species you used to be able to see them in a kelp dive the, the dive masters are telling us 30 of them on a dive sometimes are gone they haven't found them. They don't know where they are. They've disappeared. And there are all these news reports of Port and Starboard killing 12, 15, 17 plus uh, seven gills a day. So we're like, oh, do we tell that story? Well, the problem is we'll never be able to get footage of Port and Starboard. It's one, in, you know, like it's a huge yeah. ocean. We're not going to find two orcas, like two specific orcas. And sure enough, they literally swim right by the boat while we're putzing around at the seal colony. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's been there's been film crews that have gone to South Africa to document Port and Starboard, and they've spent months and never seen them. Yeah, you know, so exactly. we couldn't really plan on that. Been seen, like, you could tell that story, but you can't really show that story because, like, there's no way we'd be able to rely on being able to see that. You know, and the, the footage of those things, you know, I know Netflix bought a bunch of it. Like, there's just not a lot of it out there, and it's not. It's not very. It's not like you can just license footage of that. Like, there's just would have been too hard to do that. So. Even even showcasing that or making that part of our story would have been so hard until it actually happened. Until we were there and it was like, holy crap, there they are. We can actually get it with our own cameras and our drones and be able to tell that story, which ended up being a huge part of the episode yeah. because you know what's happening there. It's it's pretty wild what they've done to the white the white shark population and now the seven gills. I mean they've they've looked. They're now the seven gills are in completely different areas. The white sharks are basically gone. You know, it's just, it com it's completely changed and disrupted tourism there. Like the whole people going there to see sharks jumping out of the water. It's just, it's not, it's not quite what it used to be because of, because of these two animals, you know, which is pretty remarkable. Well, there's a reason for it. I mean, those, those orcas are normally predating on offshore species like makos and smaller sharks and things like that. And because of overfishing, they've yeah, resorted sure. to moving in to find alternative species to right. predate on. So it's inevitably because of us and our consumption of seafood, but you know, what, what's an orca to do, but go decimate everything because they're the apex on top like of it. 
and for us to be able to see that is insane i mean i think i think while we were there after we saw them we like all started googling like how rare actually like is (laughs) this because you know we've already had we have enough stuff going on in our minds like preparing for the show that like okay like we're not going to see the orcas it's a part of the show in some aspect but like i think they've only been seen like three or four times since the 70s or 80s or something like that like they they're they're not normally seen like that and for that to happen like People will watch that and be like, oh, they fake that. It's like the same thing with catching that shark on the beach the first night. Like, it takes a lot yeah. of research and preparation to be able to do these things and some luck, of course. Oh, I remember that morning we saw the, the port and starboard. The somebody, I think it was Philip at breakfast that morning was like, oh, they somebody spotted the orcas in False Bay. And I was like, we're going to see them. It's going to be amazing. I told Forrest and Forrest was like, false bay is like 300 square miles. Like, just, yeah. just so in the bay doesn't mean we're going to see them all. Like, oh, yeah, I'm an idiot. I'm sorry. That's, that's stupid. And then eight hours later, it's like, nope, there they are next to the boat. So cool. And it's always a treat seeing orcas. You know, if, if you guys have watched our shows that are listening to this, you've probably seen the Jaws of Alaska where the four of us are on the tin dinghy chasing yeah. those orcas around. And I mean, I, I don't think I've ever yeah. seen more large grown men nearly brought to tears in a small boat than at that Rock moment. Nearly brought to tears. No, yeah, nearly, not nearly, nearly brought to tears. Brought actual tears. tears. Actual tears. Actual tears. Actually yeah. yeah. That's what I'm saying. Well, okay. I was trying to make us a man. By that, for, that, no, was like, not. that was like four hours. I mean, the sun didn't set till 2 a.m. And we were out there until 1.30 in the morning. And yeah, we John, had a I was like, I like, had a hydrophone. So we had the hydrophone in the water surrounded by like, 12 different pods of orcas to be able to hear that and see that for that amount of time was like it was wild so cool. definitely yeah. beats the kelp dive in california let's be real or yeah. In <laughs> yeah. um well like i said we'll talk well, i'll talk about christine and bring her on if people want to hear more behind the scenes stuff but moving forward we had you know all this cool stuff went down we saw port and starboard we all love seeing orcas even if these two are pricks um you know we had we had a really good time the diving was epic. It was challenging. It was freezing cold, by the way. I don't think we mentioned this. You watch these shows, you don't realize, like, the water was in the high to mid-40s the whole time. And even in a seven mil, when you're in the water six-plus hours a day, like, you are chilled to the core at the end of that. Yeah, um, the bone. And, yeah. And uh, anyway, we the next scene, which, which Kyle will pull up in a second here, we knew what we were going to do because I called Ryan off camera and I said to Ryan, I said, um, hey, you know, like, we're really struggling to find the orcas. And between Ryan and our dive master, uh, they were like, oh, well, you know, we think they might be in some of these marinas and harbors because people catch them and things like that. But that's not a very good show. So we did this, like, tongue-in-cheek call right here, which is kind of a bummer because in the beginning, it was uh, it was very tongue-in-cheek. It was very, like, ho-ho, you know, like, wink at the camera. <laughs> But then uh, the network was like, no, it's too bullshitty, you know, like pull it back. So we pulled it back to what the real phone call was like, where Ryan goes, hey, why don't you guys check inside some of the harbors where people have been reporting seeing big shadows? And uh, uh, the uh, <laughs> the setup for going into this harbor right here is, again, one of my favorite scenes. Uh, JQ, run, it, run us through this. Well... There was, you know, it was the weird approach of like, how do we film this and make it, you know, as goofy as Forrest is? And sure enough, we didn't have to say much after that. He's like, I got this. And he strapped up full scuba suit and just started walking walking out to the end of the pier. Obviously, no swimming or diving allowed, but that's never stopped Forrest in his life. And he just slowly just makes his way out to the end of the pier and... Everyone is watching. There's people out with their phones, like watching this lunatic just trot Kid through him. like a, a normal like tourist pier, but it keeps freezing on us. Um, <laughs> oh, here we go. It doesn't take long, and forces in the water and disappears below the water. And sure enough, we we got what we were after. There and while we did sort of get permission. The word sort of is very loose there. It was like somebody called somebody and said, can we dive the pier? And they were like, no, but we're not there on Tuesdays. And we're like, okay, wink, wink. So we're like, fuck it. On Saturday at like two o'clock. Yeah. (laughs) So we go in this harbor 
and uh, it's us three. It's me, Johnny, and JQ. And I don't know, like Johnny, what were you thinking when we hit the water? Like I. I, I thought we had a decent shot at seeing them, but I didn't think it was like a guarantee. And I certainly didn't think it was going to be what we did see. Yeah. I mean, that visibility was less, I mean, uh, on our best day it was probably 10 feet, five to 10 feet. Right. Um, and having a hot tip like that, not, a, it doesn't always pay off. So, I mean, how many marinas and harbors are there in the Cape town area? You know, those, those, those sharks could be anywhere. So for us to dive in and, you know, out of the murk, see those animals come close to us. And I mean, at some points we had five or six of them at one time and they did get feisty, you know, from time to time because we have our lights on our cameras and all these things. But I mean, it wasn't the most spectacularly beautiful diving we've ever done. That's for sure. But what a weird place to find sharks. I, I just, yeah, I thought it was so bizarre. It was like one of the few instances where human interference even with all the garbage and shit that was down there was actually helping the animals but only as yeah. you said because humans had interfered prior to change the whole ecology to begin with right so it's sort of a weird juxtaposition there but jq you i mean like i think we all were a little bit intimidated at first so i've seen seven gills out here in california i don't know half a dozen times not a shit oh, yeah. ton but, and you know i was not expecting them to be so big and so in your face like they were here like what were you thinking jq well, we hopped in the water, and as you can see from that last clip, you're jumping into murky green water, and as Johnny said, our best day was like 10 feet of visibility, and we had that on our best day, but the other several days we were down there, it was maybe four or five feet. So you jump in the water, and almost immediately you lose everybody. You don't know where Johnny is. You don't know where Forrest is. Like You're looking around, and unless you see a, a, like a flick of a flashlight, you're kind of lost almost immediately. And then to make matters just that much more fun, you drop from the green to the bottom and it's still middle of the day daylight and everyone's just swimming towards just complete black abyss underneath the pier and the barge and all these like insane industrial just boats that, you know, we're you can see right here, it's it's pretty much a night dive at one o'clock in the afternoon. Right. Wow. It's if we didn't have those flashlights, you know, you're all of a sudden you're pointing the flashlight this way and then you're getting nosed in the head from one of like the other direction. <laughs> we watched that happen to Johnny twice. One nice oh. little uh, butt nibble and then another one that went after your light and just... I almost lost my ass cheek, man. <laughs> yeah. Not oh yeah. I forgot about the butt bite. Yeah. Yeah. yeah explain that. Explain what happened yeah. there. That was pretty funny. I looked back and saw it right as it happened. I mean, there were there's I mean at any given point, there's five or six sharks around us and you're focused on one. But if anybody knows anything about shark diving, it's like, or underwater cinematography with sharks is like, if you get a shot, you're typically on a wide angle lens. So you can kind of hold that shot, but all like at all times, like have your head spinning around, looking around you, checking on your buddies and things like that. And I mean, for a split second, when you're not looking, here comes a, a cheeky little shark that saw my gray card that I keep on me to do custom white balance slip out from my BCD and was just dangling in between my legs. And, you know, it's a shark. So it sees something flailing around. It's going to try to check it out and take a bite at it. And it bit my gray card, but like, I'm not kidding. Like came in at like 10 miles an hour and hit me right in the grundle, like <laughs> me right in between the legs. And I'm like, Whoa, I thought it was like forest messing with me. And I'm like, no, that's a shark. And it chomped on my gray card. Luckily, it was my butt. Force team. would never do that, though. Force would no, never do that. No. no, I was like, oh, I was fine. Force being weird. He must have had his tummy rubbed earlier. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. I still well, have yeah. that great card that's just covered in shark teeth. I, yeah. I that shit and that was sort of, you know, that was like mission accomplished for us. We found the seven gills that we set out to find. We documented a whole pile of unique endemic shark species. And, uh, you know, I think. Look, it was a hard shoot. You know, it wasn't the most uncomfortable shoot we've ever had, but we were fighting weather. We were freezing cold. We had some surgy, murky conditions. There were a lot of days where it was just super stressful because we were really forcing it when the conditions were not cooperating. But it all sort of shook out in the end like it seems to do. And uh, it was a lot of fun. And then we got absolutely no rest. And maybe last thing, Johnny, you could talk about the rap party night. And uh, we got absolutely no rest and turned around and went to Australia the next morning. <laughs> yeah, we did. Well, if anyone would understand that when you have a group of friends that are working on a show together and they've worked their asses off for 
two weeks in the heat, in the cold water, a little celebration is needed at the end of every show. So we have something called a wrap party. So on the last night before we fly out or usually a few days before we fly out, so we're not too hungover before our next adventure, we go out for a little party, a little dinner, and some of the crew decides to go out a little later than others and some go to bed with their wives and whatever. And we decided to go out in our, what was Liam's position on that? AC. Know, PA, assistant, AC, yeah, in our bed. bed. And so our uh, our PA slash AC slash force assistant slash everything, you know, the super glue for the show <laughs> needs, a, needs a few drinks. So we go out, uh, we're, we're cruising the town. There's like four or five of us at some point. And, you know, next thing I know, he's taking like five or six shots. I'm like, all right, it's only like nine o'clock. Dude. Like, <laughs> they think, this is dinner. So we go out and like the whole time we've been joking about like, like I was talking about that big brother, little brother relationship. It's like, he's talking about wrestling me and he likes giving me a little, little lip here and there. And I'm like, all right, dude, like, just wait, like, it's going to, it's going to come your way. So he like squares up with me in the middle of the street in front of like 200 people in all these bars. And, you know, we just go at it on the cement and the, the night goes from there. We go out to the bar. I don't want to talk about the strip club because that definitely didn't happen, but <laughs> I go, I go home. I'm like, all right, I'm done. It's two 30 in the morning. I'm, I'm done. Like, I'm good. That was fun. Next thing I know, Liam's gone. I don't know where he is. He's in the Uber. I guess he lost his phone and his wallet at the strip club. I go to bed. I have no idea what's happening. I wake up in the morning with my brother. Like he's sharing the bed with me. And I guess you guys can pick it up from there because uh, JQ our- had the best. No, no, no. JQ has no, no, to no. tell <laughs> I, oh, that's true. I, Mitch I, and I medic, started. Don't forget about the I'm, medic. Don't forget yeah, about the medic. Yeah. <laughs> this is so, new for us. I, I, we wake up early to uh, just eat breakfast and get ready to roll out. And uh, Mitch and I meet at like 7 a.m. for breakfast. And we're sitting down and uh, Presh, our medic, walks in with all of his bags packed. Right? And Presh, Presh and Liam are like the South African and American clones of each other. They're like young naive haven't traveled like very innocent boys who went way too hard the night before and Presh rolls in drops his suitcases down and mitch goes hey man you uh you okay you don't look so good and he goes yeah no yeah and we're like wait what and he, we're like he's like his shirts we- his shirts inside out too his shirts Don't inside out that. he's <laughs> his shirt disheveled <laughs> and uh and and he goes i think liam's dead <laughs> and we're like, what? And uh, Mitch is like, wait, wait. We're like, gets very serious. He's like, Presh, what are you talking about? And he's like, I think Liam's dead. And then we like start grilling him. And like, I'm starting to panic. And then halfway through the panic, Mitch goes, Presh, Presh, hold on a second. How on a scale of one to ten, how drunk are you right now? And Presh goes like, okay, you don't have to say okay. anymore. Yeah, you you've said enough. Yeah. So he told yeah. us that Liam was dead like five times, and then he was just like, "Well, yeah." No, he said he never said Liam's dead. He said we lost Liam. We lost Liam. Yeah, we lost Liam. Yeah, we lost Liam. And then it was just and like, like well, "What do you mean?" He was like, "I got, I got back like five or six with Liam," and I was like, "What do you mean? You just said you lost Liam." And I'm like, "What do you?" So then he was like, "Oh yeah," and I'm like, "How drunk are you still?" And he was just like, "I don't know, like a nine maybe," and I was just like. <laughs> I mean, he's, a, he's a super nice kid, but he, I don't think I saw him drink at all the entire trip and he drank enough for all of us on the last night. And then, he, so we've heard that Liam's disappeared. Nobody knows where he is. We heard that he got into a random Uber. He was chasing girls around all the things you're not supposed to do in the back streets of South Africa. And <laughs> allegedly his phone, Oh, allegedly he ran down a street chasing an Uber who drove off with his phone and wallet. And that was the last time anybody saw him. So we were like, Jesus Christ, we've killed Liam. Like it's, it's he's like this young, sweet kid. And uh, we're like, we better go check in his room. So me, Mitch and JQ head up to his room and JQ, you have to say it. I'm not saying it. You have to say it. JQ's in the lead. Mitch is behind him and I'm in the back and we get a key to his room. JQ opens the door. And <laughs> what did you see JQ? <laughs> Well, the last thing that we heard from Presh is that he lost Liam, but then he was with Liam, but he actually has no idea if Liam made it home. So we're we're yeah, trying to fill in these blanks that he's creating, but then we just don't know what's true or what's not anymore. And we're like, okay, we like we have to go to his room and see see if he's like okay, if he's one, if he's there. Like we just have to like 
fill in these blanks that precious left out. So we go up to his room. We're knocking on the door. No answer. Knocking turns to pounding, pounding yep. turns to screaming and berating and like being probably as mean as we've ever been to a coworker and just <laughs> nothing. Absolutely nothing. So we go well, we back. To the front we didn't know if he was alive. Like we right. know he was there. He could be on the street somewhere. Right. Like we were, it wasn't like we were kidding around. Like we were genuinely yeah. a little worried at this yeah. point. Yeah. Like we didn't yeah. know if he was there, if he was gone. Like so we go down to the front desk. We fill them in as much as we need to in order for them to be like, "Yes, yeah, say no more. We we got you." So they walk up. They or no, they just give us a key to his room. No, it was a but guy. Yeah. It was like a guy in the hallway. And Forrest is like, "Hey, can you open this door for me?" And the guy was like, "Yeah, oh. sure." Which Right. Poor, poor right. security. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he literally said the random door. The guy's like, "Yeah, okay." It was like a yeah. guy, like a custodian, was just like, "Sure," and like opened the door for us. So we just walked into the room, and then. But yeah, so we we walked through. <laughs> we walked through the front of the door, and we're all just like pushing each other forward. Like, you go look. You go look. And we like literally can see on the end of the bed just a foot. We're like, <laughs> okay. And then we're like, all right. Well, the last thing we heard is he was chasing girls at a strip club and we're like we have to see if he's alone or if he's with someone so we're like slowly inching further and further and then I'm, I, I'm convinced that someone pushed me and I don't know what but all of a sudden I go one, one head length too far and I'm sure you guys all know this about Forrest but we see a lot of Forrest anatomy on all of his shows and and that's we've come to accept it but when you see other co-workers anatomy that you didn't want to see then you know that's that's it's like all right i've been up more like a two this time but we literally look over and we're screaming we're screaming at liam and he's fully <laughs> on his back just starfish <laughs> naked on the bed not moving and we're throwing stuff at him and he finally like wakes up he's like whoa whoa what 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 are you guys doing we're like what are you doing but he finally like comes to we realize he had lost everything he was still completely just a hammer drunk at 9 a.m. in the morning. And yeah, but he, Liam's alive, everyone. And so, alive. <laughs> yeah. so alive. Yeah. and from he's there, right. we flew to Australia and did the whole thing over, which is something I never yeah. want to do again. Two back to back sharks. We'd be shows. smart enough at that point to just get on a plane and go home. But no, we, yeah. we no. went straight to no. <laughs> But I again. think. You know, I think we'll save uh, Shark versus Snake and the Australia behind the scenes for uh, another video. If uh, if you guys watching this liked it, comment, let us know. We're we're certainly happy to do this again. It's pretty fun reliving the shows, and uh, you know, this is like what we do, right? The four of us are in a group text, as you can imagine, and we text many times per day and make fun of each other and talk about things that happen and talk about the next trip that we're planning. And it's uh it's pretty unique, I would say, because. Most production teams are not four guys that consider each other closest of friends who, you know, are all each other's birthday parties and weddings and you name it and uh, come up with ideas together and pitch and develop shows. And then everybody has a unique skill set in the field. So it's pretty um, it's pretty cool. And I think people will enjoy get a kick out of hearing from everyone here. You know, Forrest, I got a fun way to end this video. I wasn't planning on doing this. Oh, God. Should I? Oh. Should I, JQ? I yeah, don't know. Is Just this is doing. Is this moonshine? No, it's my oh. secret, JQ. Oh, oh. absolutely, yes. I'm going to end the video. All right, oh, guys. Hundred percent. Since you guys are all on my way, and you guys are all some of my best friends, Forrest, I was going to tell you in a day or two when I saw you, what I'm going to be a dad. Hey, yeah, I'm doing it. That's awesome. it. Oh, yes. nice, man. That's epic. That's epic. Yes, congrats, yeah. Mitch. That's amazing, dude. Holy wow. shit. Wow. Damn, that's exciting. Dude, congrats. Dude, Pretty I know. Cool. I've got so I... much dad advice for you. Like, so much. That was for years of the road, so. I'll tell you amazing. exactly what not to do. Dude, congrats, <laughs> man. That's amazing. Thank you. Um, wow. Oh, man. Awesome. So, All right, guys. Definitely good, a good, good way to end you. the show. Yeah, Mitch, I'm going to call you to gossip about your new child immediately but guys thanks for jumping on thanks for jq you're in the bahamas johnny you're in a camper in utah right now where are you outside mitch and I are, nice mitch and i are home everybody made it work thank you guys so much and uh mitch big congrats man that's that's amazing yeah. papa mitch papa mitch <laughs>